Welcome, everyone. Can everyone hear, hear me all right? Uh, welcome this afternoon to um, a filmmaker talk with uh, Emma Davey, whose new film, The Oil Machine, is playing it at the festival this year as part of the Master's Strand. Um, we're going to talk over the coming hour about the film, certainly, that's playing here. But more than that, I like to use this opportunity to really delve into who this person is, what her passions and preoccupations are in terms of her artistic practice. Um, and we have a few clips to show you from a couple of um, previous films and a couple of clips from the new film. Uh, just a show of hands, who, who has seen The Oil Machine? Has anyone seen, just, okay, just one person. Two people. Okay, good, 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 good. So. I think before we dive into the in intricacies of the documentary practice and, and all that that encompasses, as well as your filmography, um, I'd really like to start in the conversation by hearing you talk about your performance theater beginnings with this collective, with your mentor, Robert Lepage, um, because you told me that working in that mode and that mode of creation really has had ramifications into how you're working today, how you're teaching today. If you could just talk a little bit about, you know, the themes that emerge from you from that past collaboration and that free way of working beyond form and structure. That would be a great place to start. So I promised the sound people that I wouldn't wave my hands around too much when I talk so that I managed to keep this microphone in front of my mouth. So if you see me beginning to move this right hand, give me, give me a nudge and I'll <laughs> attempt not to. I can move this one, but not that one. Um, so yes, my background is in performance theatre. I, um, I studied performance actually in, in Paris um, with the aim of becoming a director in theatre. Um, I didn't really know what kind of theatre, but then I went to see, um, when I was young, when I was in my really early 20s, I went to see a show by Pina Bausch, who I'm sure you all know, and it changed the way I thought about everything. And I came away feeling um, that I had to change my perspective in theatre, and that um, theatre was allowed to do things that I didn't think it was allowed to do. That it like, was, such as? well, I just remembered this wonderful moment in a Pina Bausch play. I'm sure many of you have seen some of her work or seen documentaries about her work. And it's so, it so speaks to the intimacies of human experience. And I remember this moment at the beginning, I think it was Contact Off. I, in fact, I didn't know anything about her work. I just saw a poster and thought it looked quite cool. So I thought I'd go and I came away electrified. Um, I remember some so some man begins the whole the whole um the whole piece by walking in front of the audience and, and staring at them. And then some woman comes and walks too and they just stare at the audience and that moment, you know, breaks this illusion of what we're in. But then I don't know if it was then, but then there follows this sort of like strange, playful fight between them that at first just looks like a game and gradually borders on something else. And I think a lot of moments like that, that she had um, found through asking many questions about people's own experience, I think made me think that theatre was capable of expressing these um, hidden moments of our experience, but also these moments that go beyond language, these moments that um, need some kind of physical expression. So it moved me into a kind of physical, physical theatre and moved me completely away from conventional narratives. And I started my own theatre company when I went to live in Glasgow. Um, and at that time, it was ancient history, but at that time we were what is called a city of culture, so it was 1990. And we had these amazing creators from all over the world coming in and out. Um, and I had this little company that we tried things out and we did unconventional shows in boiler houses or in parks or in all kinds of spaces. And we began often with questions. Um, and around about that time, this 
Quebecois theatre director called Robert Lepage. Some of you might have heard of him, who's an amazing director who works in a very visual way. He came and did a workshop with some of us to see if we, any of us might end up working with him on mm -hmm. a show called Tectonic Plates. And um, I just want to tell you how he began the workshop because it was so exciting. For me as a creative practitioner, it was so exciting. He got this big bit of paper out and said, I want you to draw your impressions of the world. So not like an accurate map, but just your strange impressions. So I remember like, you know, we draw these funny images of New York and, you know, some film that we'd seen from there or whatever. We were always using the cliches of, of the culture that we came from, of course. And from that, we began um, developing little improvisations or sketches, but it was so interesting because it was all a wee bit like Pina Bausch's work too. Mm -hmm. It was all located in the experiential and it was located in these sorts of, as I say, these kind of cultural cliches. And from that, we actually ended up devising a whole show. I was lucky enough to be one of the ones selected. And so for two years, we created this show that um, went to the National Theatre in London and then it kind of had a different life when it went to Canada and we performed it in a theatre there. Mm. It had a big swimming pool in the middle of the set and um, one of the most joyous times of creation for me was when we were, we were flown as a group who were going to work on this, on this show. We were flown to um, Montreal and we were told, you can just improvise some scenes using the swimming pool and using a pianist, and here's some themes. So like there was a theme of the missing father, and we'd invent these little moments with this musician, and then gradually those moments would become part of the, the theater play. So it ended up being a play, and then ended up being a film directed by Peter Mettler. Um, who, who you would make Becoming Animal with. Who many, many years, years later. later I made Becoming Animal with and who became a good friend. Mm -hmm. So I think the question of performance and how the collaborative device process is a very generous process and a very difficult one. And it was a great um, training ground actually for any creative process. Because I think what I learned, um, which I still relearn every time, <laughs> is that the problem inherent in a process is often the biggest clue to the form of what you're making. And maybe, is that clear or should I elaborate on that? I, I would like you to elaborate on that okay. very much so because okay. I, after you're done with this, I'm very curious to know how that trajectory of performative impulses led you to moving image, yeah. which is, by its very nature, structural in some sense. But yes, continue. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and not talk about performance the whole time, don't worry. You can talk <laughs> I about will get onto documentary, but I, I think there were, there were clues within the, the, performance the, 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 the performance process that made me very um, process orientated when I came to, to working in film. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so for example, we made this play or we devised this play called The World's Edge, which was based on um, Columbus's arrival in the Americas or what was not called the Americas then and basically the invasion of Europe, of that whole continent. And we um, collaborated, in fact, somebody from Mexico came over deliberately to work with us and we collaborated with various other performers who um, came from very different cultures. So mm -hmm. having a di diverse group of narratives was what we knew would form the, the play. I worked also with somebody who was a sculptress who was always making amazing images. And one of the images that she kept making was putting this this basin of blood over her head, which was incredibly dramatic and sensational. And meanwhile, somebody was blowing up lots of skeletons and creating this pile and the stage of all these skeletons. And there was amazing images happening all over the stage. 
But I was getting more and more frustrated, and it must have been the documentary maker in me, because I was going, but we need to understand the facts of what happened. So we need to go through the history of really what was going on. You know, what happened when Captain Bilbao let his dogs loose and, on people in what, was, what has become Peru, or, you know, different stories like that. So actually, my urge to tell those stories became part of the conflicting narrative of that narrative need to get the facts out and this other kind of impulse to create images and distill the experience in something more metaphoric and something more visual. So that actually created the synthesis of a play which just existed in the moment. And it's been written about, but we didn't film it. And, um, it was very ephemeral and disappeared. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how that led to documentary, to go back to your question, mm -hmm. I think some of um, the, the frustrations of the performative process for me naturally led me to want to do something that was um, more slightly more controlled. I mean, right. this this sort of play between control and lack of control, I'm, I'm sure many of you are also creative practitioners and understand that that strange dance we do as creatives where we set certain limitations and we set certain premises for work so that we can kind of lose control and then we hunger for control again. So I think, mm -hmm. yeah. But in this in this sense of play, I mean, a lot of your beginning work, you know, like your your film with with the kids, like yeah. what you know, this yeah. this notion of what is creativity. I mean, there are some who believe that in, we the creative impulse is innate in every human being. It's just the the roadmap to that to that impulse or the roadmap to freeing up that impulse. And you teach as well, so you're constantly working with. I think students and, and young filmmakers too who are constantly bumping up against this almost self-imposed wall we put up, you know, about what we perceive our limitations to be, what we perceive the limitations of the spectator to be, what we perceive the limitations of the form to be. So I'd like, just when you started making moving image work, what were, what were, can you name sort of the precise ways in which this past, you know, almost too free expression helped you traverse that territory? And I'm sure it's a practice. I'm sure it takes years and years to sort of hone where it is on that spectrum you feel the most comfortable. But I'd like you to talk about that in the guise of a director, of someone, again, in the shoes of someone who's orchestrating it all, um, if you would. You know, so many different images are coming to mind of um, a filmic process, which for me has a life of its own, which in a way you follow and you fuel. And um, I think as a maker and as a, as a mentor, what I'm always trying to encourage the people I work with to do is to um, is to try to be open to 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 this living thing that's emerging. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time. Um, sometimes you have to put deliberate limits in order to to find that. So I guess the thing that the thing that I find interesting is how we um, yeah, I guess how we how we maneuver that space where we where we do create some kind of some kind of yeah. I mean, Pamela referenced a, a film that I did um, when I when I um, moved from performance into, into film, um, I worked with some 11-year-olds making a documentary, um, which was really about this incredible art room that they had in this, in this school where they could go anytime they wanted to explore ideas, to draw these amazing big canvases about their experience, and to really, um, in a way, express themselves in a way that they couldn't in normal school. And these were people who, these were children who didn't come from backgrounds where there was necessarily 
a lot of culture in their homes. It was a, a little village in the highlands of Scotland. And um, it was run actually by the children, this art room. So they could come any time they wanted and they could um, basically, I suppose, find an autonomy through what they did. So we, we made this film together, um, looking, at, looking at, I suppose, the limitations adults pose on children and mm -hmm. on their received notion of what children are and what children can create. And I think um, one of the things that we kept doing when we looked at the footage was they could be incredibly free in their art process, but as soon as they came to working in, in film, they had so many received ideas of what film should be. Right. And so many received ideas of what documentary should be that they kept trying to be like they were in some kind of program, like now we're doing this, now we're doing that. So we had to work with this thing where we'd look, back, look over the footage at the end of most days and say, is it boring? Is it like television? And try and basically make it as adventurous as their own artistic process in mm -hmm. their in their um, in their artwork which was was very different obviously than than what they were filming so I think I think we sometimes have to be saved from ourselves as, as filmmakers um, in that we, we we need some kind of structure sometimes in order to find that 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 rift in order to find that um, that playing space mm -hmm. When you, so with, with Morag McKinnon, you decided to co-direct, or I believe she was, was she the entry into the story, or how did that collaboration for I Am Breathing, which we're going to see a clip from in a minute, but you know, there, this film, I feel, in a way, was a huge leap for you, not in terms of how you made films, but why you would document certain things, like the importance and the urgency, let's say, of capturing life in medias race, but also in a process, in this case of dying, someone dying. Um, and the film for me is so, I just rewatched it recently. It's so beautiful because somehow you're able to ground the story in what's happening but because this man, because of an illness, is trapped inside his body, there are ways in which you release his memory and his imagination filmically, cinematically. And this is always a huge risk, um, usually, to really illustrate the mind and the spirit of a person filmically as an extension of the body that you're filming, as an extension of the voice we're hearing. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. what you, your approach was, yeah. what the urgency was, yeah. and, and again, what the, I guess what the presented limitations were that you had to yeah. process as you were shooting? Because it's a very immediate film. Of course, it's constructed, but there's something about it too that feels urgent in such a quiet, sort of poignant way about a life yeah. um, leaving. So Neil was a friend of um, a friend of mine who was a fiction filmmaker called Morag McKinnon. And uh, Morag asked me to help her make a little campaigning documentary because Neil had motor neuron disease and was paralyzed from the neck down. He was 33 years old and he didn't have long to live, and he was desperate to communicate. And at that time, he wrote this really funny um, blog. And um, basically, we went down to try to find out if there was a way where we could help him find a voice mm -hmm. through making something that might raise some money or something like that. But the sheer, fo uh, sheer force of who he was, um, a funny man who needed passionately to help people be aware of this illness because he had a son that he was scared might get it and his father had died of it. So they had a, 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 a hereditary strain of it. So because he was scared of, um, of dying without having done this, he had this desperate need to, 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 to speak. And in a way, the film 
worked with that need. Mm -hmm. But I had so many ethical questions because, as I'm sure you might understand, it felt, it felt problematic to film somebody at that stage of their lives for many reasons. Um, so what Pamela's referencing, and which I, I hope that we'll, we'll see, was this imaginary world that we, that we envisaged in the film, mm -hmm. where we filmed him, but we also filmed his blog. So his blog became, in a way, it became what allowed us to make the film, actually, Interesting. interestingly enough. Because when we put together the footage, we had just a lot of footage of somebody's physical suffering. Um, and it felt like that was not a representation of his life because actually he had this incredibly rich inner life which was um, something completely different than the embodied physical dissolution of, um, of his freedom from the point of view of not being able to use his legs, not being able to use his arms. So in order to answer the ethical question of the problem of the image, almost kind of, it felt like the image sapped the life out of him. Mm -hmm. It felt like just seeing him sort of sitting there, if you can imagine someone just sitting with a big breathing machine, in a way he'd, he'd lost his, his, his kind of, he was part of the machine basically. Exactly. So we wanted to give him back his agency. And the way to give him back his agency was to use the blog. Because the blog was where he had freedom. He had this incredible imaginary world, but also this incredible resilience and defiance actually, this beautiful defiance. Let, let's watch the clip. My dad died of it when he was 51. That was back in 1986. I was 20, 22. And he, he, I think the examination of his character by me at that time turned me into who I am today to a certain extent. He was outgoing, fun-loving, uh, honourable guy, I think. I think I kind of weathered Dad dying okay. He had it. I felt like he'd given me everything he wanted to give me. There's 
so many beautiful things going on here. You know, the I notice in so much of your work, you, and I love them too, there are these traveling shots. There are these shots of movement and forward momentum. And I see this actually in, in almost all of the things that you've done, um, that there's a moment where, in a way, the claustrophobia of what it must feel like, you know, in, in Neil's case, to be trapped in this apparatus, trapped in his body, um, and even also, too, in Becoming Animal and in the oil machine as well, which we'll see examples of, there is this there is this way filmically that you really demand the gates to be busted open and and this forward momentum of the real you know the speed of life as it were um and the ability to move and explore um is really important is is that a subconscious thing that you find mm. yourself needing those spaces in in everything you do because Moving image and making documentary in particular does pre can present a very strictured form, not just in sound and image, but in, as you were alluding to, in the idea, into something that you want to say, in, in for information you want to impart. And I see you, I really see this battle, you know, in trying to weight those um, impulses. Um, it must be very tricky somehow. I mean, what are, I'd like you to talk about the frustrations too a little bit in that process where you might, like if you can think of a solution where you feel blocked in that sense, where you feel you really do need to breathe air into it. What, if you can just take us a little bit through, through even as you're sitting in the edit what the rhythmic way your body knows what what's needed yeah. in that next frame i guess there are many filmmakers here i'm sure who identify with this that we film with our bodies um we watch films with our bodies um and for me it's a very visceral embodied experience to be with a camera filming somebody and um to be present with neil in his stuckness was, as you can imagine, you, you're using the word frustrating. I, I think what was, what was the task was to really try with the camera to imagine what that stuckness mm -hmm. was. And of course, I realized the limitations of a filmic imagination and the limitations of any process where we can really enter the experience of another. And I think, yet again, that touched on the ethics of the film and on the structure. So. The movement felt like a bit of an antidote to that because mm -hmm. in a way he was always saying, I'm not just this body. And he was determined to inhabit a space that wasn't constricted, that was free. And in a way he was teaching us about that freedom. So um, it, was, it was really interesting actually, because you say this thing about, you mentioned Pamela, what we're allowed to imagine for somebody that we're filming. And I, I think it is problematic to imagine too much. So it was okay to imagine roads. It was okay to imagine really simple imagery. But mm -hmm. as soon as we imagined anything too complex, it felt um, disrespectful to him. So it had to, it had to be quite a tight thing that we were, that we were working with in terms mm -hmm. of that, not, mm -hmm. not too, not too, um, but so I, I think some of the frustrations of um, of his his position led to the the camera needing to move. Mm -hmm. But I always need to move. I need to move as a person and need to need to. Yeah, so so I mean, in I, in an edit, I I think yeah. oh gosh, I find an edit physically um, so agonising because I'm. Looking at it, was so, I'm looking at the material with my body in such a way that, um, you know, I, I'm kind of half in in the screen and half out of it, and and um, I think I think we, we we need to to be carried by a film. It needs to speak to our bodies, and it needs to speak to that part of us that is kinetic, that dances with images, that mm -hmm. doesn't just work in that um, cerebral way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think this is a good lead-in, actually, to Becoming Animal, because, again, 
in this in this collaboration with um, David Abrams, the philosopher, his ideas, his very heady ways in which sens our sensorial nature and our lifestyles have somehow collided in a very bad way, in a very damaging way. Um, and relating that to the larger you know, world of nature, the larger world around us is hugely complex and it's also very heady stuff. And you and I would just like you to talk about, again, the collaboration with Peter and the ways in which you initially tried to problem solve how you would approach these things visually. Um, because this film, more than anything I think you've made, is very experimental in nature. Um, you're trying to utilize the tools that are dictating a lot, of, a lot about the ways in which we move. Um, and I wanted to know, again, through your experience of always needing to bodily inhabit something, even an idea, even an abstract thought, how, again, that manifested initially into sound and vision. Like, what were some of the first images you, you spoke about that you needed to capture or the approach you wanted to take? I mean, I think this was yet again drawn by a certain problem in the process, and often that's the way. But um, just, to, just to backtrack a bit, Becoming Animal came about from a book that I'd read by a writer called David Abram, called Spell of the, the, the Senses, um, which had really amazed me because um, he seemed to be able to locate how... Um, through losing our animistic relationship with everything around us, that we had lost the ability to, to, to really sense how everything was in kind of communication with us. Mm -hmm. um, and the, film, the, the, the book had really shifted how I saw to a large degree. I did a workshop with him and it felt like a, a really liberating process to, um, to to use his ideas to, to actually experience a tree or experience, you know, the earth and the ground or a river or something like that. So I approached um, my friend, Peter Mettler, who I'd worked with years ago in tectonic plates and asked him if he wanted to go on an exploratory journey with David Abram to the Grand Teton Park. And Peter was up for it. And Peter's work also, I think, really works in that way of looking at perception and looking at shifts. And we had talked for many years, Peter and I as, as friends, how um, the current um, crisis that we're in, in terms of the environment, um, seemed to us to be rooted in a, in a certain crisis of perception. So we were interested in how we could look at that crisis of perception through looking at David's work. So we went on this journey thinking we'd just improvise and that we'd just sort of film what emerged as we wandered through the Grand Teton Park and that we would um, maybe pick up the camera as we're walking. But for whatever reason, David, who's a philosopher and is used to, to holding his words in a certain way, wanted to have more control than that. Mm -hmm. So he was more interested in presenting his ideas. Right. So... We came back from this exploratory trip with um, quite a lot of presentation of ideas, which wasn't really the way we wanted to go. So in a way, through that problem of this presentation, we tried to actually work in a very different way, where we were, we were really sensorially experiencing what was around us and being very conscious that our way of experiencing it was through the mediated image, was through cameras, was through microphones, was ultimately we arrived in this space as the filming animal, mm -hmm. not as um, these, these humans that were above technology, but right. were very embroiled in it. And I don't know if anyone's been to the Grand Teton Park, but it's kind of a bit like, um, 
Yeah, it's kind of like Disneyland with animals, really. There's sort of like queues of traffic going through these these roads where there's elks and bison and people going out with their cameras trying mm -hmm. to get the moment. And we very much felt part of that human cavalcade mm -hmm. of trying to capture wildlife um, and had rather this this sort of, I suppose, fanciful idea that we could, through film, try and get closer to nature, whatever that was. <laughs> um, so in a way, I, I kind of see the film as a bit of a tragic comedy where... It's a good way to describe it because, I mean, you see these tensions in the film. That's what makes it so fascinating and also so, I mean, I'm going to say off-putting, but it's not a criticism of the film. It's a criticism of the spectator and how we're so used to receiving information filmically. And here, I think the tension between what David perhaps wanted to do and what you wanted to do as visual artists, plus the phenomenon you're describing, and we'll see a clip in a second so you can see what we're talking about. But um, it's such a wild film because it's really proposing um, trying to almost break this, this um, propensity for narrative because narrative here just does not work. And, and it, must, it, it just must have been a huge challenge and a little bit of a mind bender in a way to resolve those issues. Um, I think we should watch the clip and then I really would love to talk a little bit about this, this kind of collaboration that presents seemingly more um, problems than it does solutions. And I think you told me this is actually the joy in the work. You always find the problem solving really to be, you know, the creative, what sparks the creative impetus. So yeah, let's watch the scene from Becoming Animal. ancient oral 
animistic cosmos we once inhabited. thinking about what comes next. <laughs> um, no, I love this sequence because, I mean, I think part of the solution is to, is to move into abstraction, that there really is no other solution but to, you know, I mean, this is a very beautiful segment only because it turns into some sort of almost an animation or almost like an auto uh, computer generated imagery when in fact you're just playing with speed and light and um, again, the way that movement, that fluidity of the way we move through the world. So for me, it was just a beautiful antidote to these very heady ideas delivered in a very sort of highly intellectual way um, that grounds the film more viscerally, you know, um, and, and is really illustrative of all of these complex ideas. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, it's a really high level of um, difficulty. Um, and again, I think this is a good segue into the oil machine because again, you're taking this enormous thing, this enormous, um, uh, how to put it, quandary we find ourselves in as human beings where it's not simply man versus nature. It's not something so simplistic as that but it really is about an addiction. This addiction to technology, this addiction to the way we start to interpret the world technologically, and here, the way we interpret the world through everything that we touch, buy, own, trade, that we find important in our lives, that make our lives actually as comfortable and as possible as they are. Can you talk a little bit about again, wrangling this idea, this idea of addiction to oil, this addiction to what we've created and what now stands and what is leading us very quickly to our own destruction. Um, how the apparatus of, of, again, a camera, film, sound, vision, how, and, and your casting process about who would be this constellation of voices and you told me you hate these, this idea of sitting interviews, but by necessity, I guess, you felt like you did need to sit with a wide range of people, a wide range of voices, to sort of interpret and reinterpret over and over again what's at stake for us. So, um, The Old Machine was definitely not a film I'd intended to make in any way, Pamela. And um, if I could have got out of it, I would have, because I knew it was going to be incredibly difficult as a process to connect with the oil industry, which is what we had to do to make this film. It came about from a friend who had written a book called um, Crude Britannia, and he very much wanted me to make a film of it, and I was very clear that that was very difficult. But what interested me was um, not to do that, but to try to find how to make what was basically an invisible structure of power running through all of our lives, how to give some kind of cinematic, experiential form to it. And obviously it could be located in the stuff of our lives, but more than anything, it's located in structures of power that are by their very nature difficult to grasp and difficult to, to find a, a cinematic expression for. Exactly. So we tried to do this by really trying to create um, this synthesis of voices. So to say that the oil apparatus is as present in the finance of the City of London 
as it is in the oil rigs in the North Sea of Scotland. So really, how can we bring all those different voices almost into this space where they can begin to have this dialogue together that might give us a sense of really what the texture of the problem is? Because in a way, I felt like, yet again, I needed to embodily inhabit what this all machine is and see it and feel it in order to get some kind of sense of a solution. And certain things, I think, became clear, for example, that we needed to film this huge <coughs> scope of it, which is this pipeline that runs basically from out of the North Sea all the way down through the backbone of Scotland, ending up in this power station. So mm. how could we film that? And how do we, how do we basically find a way of um, making it something that we can really map out because because so many of the rigs are in the North Sea and the North Sea is so out of our ken or out of our knowledge, out of sight. Because we put it out of sight, we do generally put it out of mind. Right. And so we needed to put put you know, I suppose really put that right in front of us in order to see it and mm -hmm. feel it. Um, because I think we we felt very strongly that if the, the sheer number and proliferation of rigs that was in the North Sea was on land, our attitude to it would be much more questioning. So there's 85% of the rigs in the North Sea are owned by foreign companies. And yet in Britain, we have some kind of illusion that it's solving our energy crisis, which it isn't at all. So there was all sorts of things that I really needed to bring out that mm -hmm. were very factual and that were mm -hmm. very... And different, you, you talked about the casting there, and different people would bring out those different right. themes and those different subjects. It wasn't left to, to one voice. It was definitely almost like a choral piece. I kind, of, I kind of conceived the piece a bit like an opera, in a way. Um, yeah. It does have an operatic feel, because I think, you know, it would have been perhaps not easier, but more of maybe you know, a quicker solution to devolve into abstraction or to use animation or to use these sort of ways in which you would move the information around, which in a lot of the films that cover topics like this sort of, it's like the default mode. It's like, well, let's just make a graph and move it around and show people, you know, how this, how this came to be. Um, and, the, and you did use the wor word opera, and it is a very operatic film. I mean, I would like to um, sort of have you talk a little bit. I mean, Julian Schwanitz, who is uh, one of the best cinematographers around, in my opinion, and also a lovely guy. Um, uh, tell me how you two collaborated visually, because during the course of the film, yes, we're sitting and visiting with people and they're talking to your camera and delivering the information and delivering, you know, their point of view about things. You have the CEO of the, of the company who is doing her spiel about, you know, her forward facing, you know, way she has to deal with public questions, um, to a young activist, you know, still in her teen years, um, and everybody in between doing all kinds of weird things and having weird titles um, of, of studying, you know, certain aspects of this. So how did you and Julian, did you just sort of have a shot list in mind of the things you wanted to capture visually? How, how did you work together trying to, yeah. to visualize all of that? I think just just... Going back, first of all, to what you said about animation, the reason why, for example, in the film, somebody draws a map of the North Sea and draws all the rigs by hand, and we were really insistent that he did it that way. Mm -hmm. The reason why a human hand was so important is because what I was trying to do was show that this machine has been made by humans. And there's a tendency to almost... almost to give up... <laughs> in terms of thinking that we can take this machine apart because it seems like it is so indestructible. And I think what I was determined to do was to show if human hands made it, human hands can disassemble mm. it ultimately. And so the human scale within this film was incredibly important. So in conversations with Julian, we talk a lot about that. Um, so 
that was a really important starting point, was to think about the machine on the one hand and what the mechanisms of it were and what the expression of it might be, but also the human, including the humanity of oil executives, <laughs> <laughs> which, um, you know, documentary, ultimately you're trying to understand the other and you're trying to understand their motives and you're trying to think from their perspective in order to to get some kind of answers or certainly to get some bigger questions. So trying to go into those meetings with a kind of open mind, I think was really important. So we didn't want one person to be more important than an other in terms of the visuals. Mm -hmm. So we worked out a kind of com comparable framing, but also Julian used this method um, of filming, which um, has been used by Errol Morris a lot, yes. which is called the in Terratron, which sounds a bit terrifying, but basically it's, um, so if I was if I was interviewing now and you were, you were Julian, like the camera would be here and basically they would be looking not at my face, but they would be looking at this box above the camera, which would have my face reflected in it, which would make their eyes look right down the lens, which was a bit strange, but, um, but I think it gave a certain equality to, mm -hmm. um, to, to the different voices of people in it. And because we had this image of the documentary as being like a room for different people to come and speak and to, to hear these diverse experiences of oil, it felt like that created a unifying factor, which Julian was very insistent on. <laughs> and he was right to be insistent on. Mm -hmm. And then the, I think the other perspective that we always had was this sense that, or certainly that I had, was the sense that we're at this moment in time, we're at this moment in history where we're, we're paused in a way, where things can still change, where we still have a certain, I mean, obviously we're not, we're not at 1.5 degrees, we're definitely not. We are more like heading for 2.6 degrees, yes. which is devastating. But at the same time, to think that we don't have agency is a real mistake. So always in the film, I was trying to articulate moments of pause, moments of stasis, moments of life is going on as ever, but it's this sort of like endlessness of the moment too, mm -hmm. which I think says something for me about the impossibility of the existential crisis that we're facing, that daily life continues, but there's this unbelievable thing that we all know is happening underneath. So I think the film, particularly in shots in the city of London, when people are going about their business, because I think obviously that's one of the biggest metaphors is people are still trading, people are still, you know, one of the, the speakers, I can't remember if it's in the segment we've chosen, but one of the speakers talks really clearly about how, um, the FTSE index in the city of London contains three point, yeah, I think 3.6 degrees of warming in it and still business as usual continues. So it was this thing of how we find a filmic language for business as usual, mm -hmm. but also this strange sort of stasis. Yes. Yeah. So the two kind of feel like they're playing against each other. Let, let's see the first clip from that. And we don't have much time left. This is going super oh. fast. But I thought we'd lost let's time watch the clip and, and we'll talk about it more. The government came out and said, yes, licensing will continue because we do need uh, oil and gas activity to continue in the basin if we are to satisfy the demand that we know is going to continue. Um, so, you know, better to have it with your homegrown uh, sector on your doorstep supporting the jobs not offshoring your emissions, not having to import the gap that would emerge if you didn't uh, continue to produce. What they wanted to make sure was that as they go forward and that for every licensing round that does come up, that it is still in line with the Paris commitments and their net zero targets of 2050. we can point to 350 billion pounds in taxes paid for production. And that doesn't even take into account the associated supply chain taxes that are generated and the jobs that are generated off that. 
by the mid-1980s, the British Exchequer was receiving a huge amount of cash from revenue from the North Sea, which of course was used to pay for everything, roads, schools, and so on. In London, a global finance centre for oil had begun to be developed since the 50s. This flourished on the back of the UK North Sea oil as well. It became a, an engine driving forward the UK finance sector. And that cash flowed into the pension system as well. Increasingly, UK pensions became linked to shares in BP and Shell. Indeed, by the 2000s, about 30% of any major portfolio of a pension fund was in these two companies combined. It's not just about the jobs in the industry, it's the spin-off of that wealth. People need a shop, people go out, people eat, people spend money, people buy things. That's how the cascade works. The market, let's say the London Stock Exchange, markets are considered to be amoral because they are, they're not a person. The market is a collection thousands of activities happening and by individual investors making decisions on behalf of other people. It's considered amoral because it's a machine. It's not an individual. Amoral is different to immoral, remember. <laughs> In the moments we have left, um, I would love for you to talk about, there's a huge impact campaign um, that you also did for I Am Breathing as well. You know, this way in which the issue or the core of, you know, Neil's illness um, could really be broken down into its component parts with, you know, um, focus groups, with, with ways in which to encounter, you know, a seemingly insurmountable problem, which this presents here. If you could talk a little bit about how important it is, that, that impact work, because, of course, after watching a film like this, the question always is, but what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And there's a sort of unease and panic that sets in, and we want more conversation. We want more information, in fact. Um, could you just talk a little yeah. bit about your work with um, your impact producer yeah. and how that, how that, why that's so key yeah. for a film like this? So also the producer of this film, Sonia Enrici, I don't know if she's here, but she also produced I Am Breathing, and both of us, I think we collaborate very closely together, but also with Ben Kempis, who is an impact campaign producer, to really try and make sure that we're not just making a film that people are watching, but that we have these conversations afterwards. And we've been amazed by the conversations. I mean, we, we've got about 120 screenings now in different places in Britain and Europe a bit too. And they're followed by um, conversations with um, lawyers with um, specifically activists who could who are talking about campaigns that 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 might involve changing where your pension is there's there's sort of such a plethora of activities and you know we we're, we've got a big debate about a t as a team whether we should suggest particular actions, but mm -hmm. instead we're letting that come from the actual screening itself and from the conversation afterwards. But the discussions themselves are incredible because they do tend to involve audiences actually also offering their own solutions and their own perspectives and that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a film that we are hoping to show to the to the oil industry in Aberdeen, actually. There, we've just got an in there. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in a few weeks, we show it to financiers in London. Who we're determined to, we're going to show it to the House of Parliament. So, as well as to, you know, many, obviously, cinema audiences and things right. like that too. But we have this very clear sense that we really want people to be talking about 
actions that can be taken on a political level, on a finance level, and on a personal level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a lot of work, though, for you as well. As as I mean that that directorial hat, you know, has also got to sit with the human being that you are, yes. and obviously, having made a film yeah. that. I can understand your resistance to making it because it is huge. It is, you know, just on the surface, superficially, it could be taken, you know, as, as something that, you know, yes, we know this, we know this, we know this, people are very complacent. Um, but the ways in which you offset neither villains nor heroes here, but that we're all in, um, I, I think is part of the great success of this film. Um, so yeah, it'll be very exciting to see, you know, how it, how it extrapolates and how it spreads. Um, and I commend you on a really, really complex, um, task. Um, I, I think the film is quite, uh, powerful, um, but it's because of the human scale of it. And, um, so yes, I applaud this. Uh, it's, I, I encourage you if you haven't seen it to go see it here at the festival. Um, and thank you, Emma, so much. This hour went by super fast. I could sit here and talk to you for another hour. Thank you um, so much. Thank you, thank, so thank you so much, so much, much for, for this coming. afternoon. Thank you, Pamela, for the yeah. opportunity to talk. It's and really interesting. Yeah. Thank and you. thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much.